The founders had good reason to look upon democracy with contempt because they knew that the democracies in the early Greek city-states produced some of the wildest excesses of government imaginable. In every case, they ended up with mob rule, then anarchy, and finally tyranny under an oligarchy. During that period in Greece, there was a man named Solon who urged creation of a fixed body of law not subject to majority whims. But where the Greeks never adopted Solon's wise counsel, the Romans did. Based on what they knew of Solon's laws, they created the 12 tables of the Roman law and in effect built a republic that limited government power and left the people alone. Since government was limited, the people were free to produce with the understanding that they could keep the fruits of their labor. In time, Rome became wealthy and the envy of the world. In the midst of plenty, however, the Roman people forgot what freedom entailed. They forgot that the essence of freedom is the proper limitation of government. When government power grows, people freedom recedes. Once the Romans dropped their guard, power-seeking politicians began to exceed the powers granted them in the Roman Constitution. Some learned that they could elect politicians who would use government power to take property from some and give it to others. Agriculture subsidies were introduced, followed by housing and welfare programs. Inevitably, taxes rose and controls over the private sector were imposed. Soon, a number of Rome's producers could no longer make ends meet, and they went on the dole. Productivity declined, shortages developed, and mobs began roaming the streets, demanding bread and circuses from the government. Many were induced to trade freedom for security. Eventually, the whole system came crashing down. They went from a republic to a democracy and ended up with an oligarchy under a progression of the Caesars. Thus, democracy itself is not a stable form of government. Instead, it is the gradual transition from limited government to the unlimited rule of an oligarchy. Knowing this, we as Americans are ultimately left with only two choices. We can keep our republic, as Franklin put it, or we will inevitably end up with an oligarchy, a tyranny of the elite. Just as there is widespread confusion regarding political systems, there is similar confusion in the economic arena. All during the 20th century, Americans were led to believe that there was a great struggle going on between capitalism and the communist world. Undoubtedly, a struggle existed, but the real adversaries were rarely identified properly. No discussion about economic systems will make sense without first defining terms. And one of the most basic terms in economics is capital, whose definition is the means of production. To illustrate what capital is, let's consider a very simple economy. On the sands of a small island, a castaway has just washed ashore. He has no food and he's hungry. He searches the island, he finds no berries, coconuts, or anything edible. He goes back into the water and tries to catch fish with his bare hands, but he fails. So he goes back up on shore and he finds a bush. He breaks off a branch, he gnaws at one end to make a sharp tip. Back into the water he goes, and with his spear, he catches fish. His spear is capital. It's the means of production for catching fish. He gave up some of his time and some of his energy to produce something he could not eat, but something that would help him to produce something that he could eat. Capital, therefore, can be tools, machinery, and even a man's handmade spear to catch fish. Such being the case, consider that the communists in the former Soviet Union, as well as in China and Cuba, have always used tools and machinery. Officials there even view people as capital. Therefore, by strict definition, are not communists capitalists? For that matter, isn't everyone a capitalist? And so, is not every economic system a capitalist system? What then is the difference between what the communist system is and what the American capitalist system is supposed to be? The difference is ownership of the capital. Is the system monopolistic, state-controlled capitalism? Or is it competitive, free-enterprise capitalism? 
It is between these two opposing economic systems that a battle has always raged. Before we proceed, let's also define free market. Basically, it's a self-regulating system in which all parties are completely free to transact with one another. But where force, fraud, or injury damages one party, the government's role is only to punish those who commit such offenses and to vindicate the rights of the other party. This protects the integrity of the free market, or free enterprise system, without intervening in it. The term private property also needs clarification, for private ownership and control of property is a key component in the free enterprise system. In order for ownership of property to be full and complete, all four of its aspects must be met. These are title, control, use, and the ability to dispose of what a person owns. In a free market economy, these aspects are unrestrained, so long as the owner does not infringe on the legitimate rights and claims of others. True ownership of property and freedom go hand in hand. They always have.